Hello friends, this video on evolution part 19 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So now we have reached towards the end of this lesson and let us look at some of the questions to see if you have got the lesson right. So question number one. Explain antibiotic resistance observed in bacteria in light of Darwinian selection theory. Now, what did we learn in Darwinian theory? So in Darwinian theory, we saw that nature always selects the fittest and nature always support the fittest. So whichever trait gives a survival advantage, nature supports that. So that was the basic uh, uh, information given by the Darwinian theory. Now what happens when bacteria is grown in a medium with antibiotics? So let us see. So when bacteria was grown in antibiotic, it was seen that most of them died because they cannot grow in a medium with antibiotics. So antibiotic kills bacteria. So that is why they all died. But there were very few of them which were resistant to the antibiotic. And why were they resistant? That was just a matter of chance which would have happened due to mutation, due to some change in the genetic makeup. So they were resistant to the antibiotic and that is why they survived. Now, these small number of bacteria which survived, this resistance gave a survival advantage to bacteria. So it could help the bacteria to survive better in adverse conditions. So that means it, it this trait had a survival advantage advantage and that is why as per natural selection this trait would be supported by nature so as a result on further reproduction there are chances that more and more resistant bacteria will be produced so as a result antibiotic resistance will be observed in bacteria because more and more resistant bacteria are being produced due to natural selection so as i said in darwinian theory we saw that nature selects the fittest so the fittest here in these terms would be the one which are resistant to antibiotic and therefore they can grow better and it eliminates the inferior ones. Inferior ones are the ones which died. So they are all gone. So only the resistant one will remain and that is why on further reproduction they will produce the resistant variety of bacteria. So nature supports only the advantageous genetic mutations. Therefore, resistant bacteria will multiply and their population will gradually increase. Question number two, attempt giving a clear definition of the term species. So when we talk about species, it is always a group of organisms that can reproduce amongst themselves. So this is the most important criteria to call a group of organisms as species. If they can reproduce or they can interbreed amongst themselves, that means they belong to the same species. However, two organisms of different species cannot interbreed. So if you remember the Darwin's finches, you saw the finches which came at the beginning to the island. They all belong to the same species. Therefore, they could reproduce amongst themselves. Even though they have shorter beak and longer beak, they could reproduce among themselves. But later, when small, small mutations happened, then what happened? A lot of different finches were produced and all these finches were not belonging to the same species so they could not interbreed with each other so they all belong to different species so organisms belonging to two different species do not interbreed so they cannot mate amongst themselves question number three Try to trace the various components of human evolution. For example, brain size and function, skeletal structure, dietary preference, etc. So how all these things changed in, in different stages of human evolution. So let us look at the important components. So one of the important components would be the brain capacity because brain is one of the very important part of human beings which is not present in all other animals. So it all the story started with, we started with Dryopithecus. So in Dryopithecus and Dramapithecus, it was even less than 400 CT, CC. With Australopithecus, it increased to 450. Then with Homo habilis, it increased to around 700. Homo erectus, it went up to 800 to 1100. And finally, Homo sapiens have 1200 to 1600 CC. So if you compare it with Dryopithecus, it has increased a lot. And that is why the brain has gradually developed. So this is how it increased with time and with evolution. 
The next thing which we'll talk about is the food habit. So initially they ate only fruits or seeds, but gradually with time they started eating different types of stuffs. Initially it was only fruits, then seeds and nuts, then herbivores, that is they ate grasses and plants and all those kind of vegetables. Then later they became only carnivores, that is they could eat only flesh. But when Homo erectus come into picture, from there on they became omnivorous. That is, they could eat uh, grass and plants. At the same time, they could eat meat as well. The third thing we'll discuss is the posture. As I said, initially they were not erect. The more human they became, they became more, the more erect they became. So here in this picture, you can very clearly see here it is completely bent. Here it is almost erect. Here also it is erect but slightly bent. Here it is completely erect and here also it is completely erect. So this portion, if you see, this, it was slightly bent before. But later in Homo sapiens, this is also erect. So it is completely erect. So the posture was initially ape-like, then semi-erect and then finally erect. But however, it was erect since Australopithecus, they were all erect but their height changed. Initially the height was around 1 meters, then it was 1.5 meters, then 1.5 to 1.8 meters. So the height also gradually increased over time. So this is how the evolution took place. And as I said, evolution is a continuous process. So evolution is happening even now. So even now in human beings, there are some small, small changes which are not getting noticed, but those changes are taking place. So maybe over a period of another thousand years or so, some changes would have already taken place. Question number four, can we call human evolution as adaptive radiation? So first try to remember what is adaptive radiation. So adaptive radiation is a process where from one species it evolution happens and it gives rise to multiple species. So from you start with one species and you end up having many species. But in human evolution that doesn't happen. Human beings are always, they all belong to Homo sapiens. So they all belong to the same species. So it is not that you ended up having multiple species of human beings. All the human beings, whether they are short, they are tall, they are fat, they are thin, they are dark, they are fair, they all belong to the same species and that is Homo sapiens. And they can all interbreed, they can all reproduce amongst themselves, so they belong to the same species. So it is not at all an example of adaptive radiation. Because adaptive radiation refers to evolution of different species with time and in this case different species did not evolve. So if you talk about adaptive radiation, the Darwin's finches are the good examples where you see that only one species of finch enter the island and then later it gave rise to around 13 to 15 species of the finches. So this is an example of adaptive radiation. Then you might ask then what kind of evolution happens with human beings? Human evolution is rather an example of anagenesis. So what is the meaning of anagenesis? Like how you have biogenesis that means formation of life. So genesis is always about formation. And what is ana all about? It is about rapid evolution in ancestral form without giving rise to new species. So in anagenesis what happens is that from the ancestors changes keep happening and the entire structure and form everything keeps on changing but it doesn't give rise to a new species. The species remain the same it is just that it keeps on changing and gradually the ancestral form uh, vanishes off. The ancestral form becomes extinct and new form exists. So that is how that is why you would have seen that right now Homo sapiens exist. So all the human beings that exist on the earth they all belong to Homo sapiens. So even the previous generation the generation which was there before Homo sapiens like the Neanderthals or the Homo habilis, the Homo erectus, all of them have gone. So at one particular period of time, only one particular uh, stage would exist in case of anagenesis. So you will not have Homo habilis and Homo sapiens all existing together. So gradually as new forms will be formed, the older form will keep on vanishing. Vanishing in the sense they will keep on dying. So the, once those forms die, so the new form which is being formed, they will carry forward the changes to the next generation and that is how this process will take place. So no new species will be formed. It will always belong to the same species but there will always be some rapid changes happening in the ancestral form. 
So with this, we have reached towards the end of this lesson and I hope that this lesson on evolution would have helped you and you would have actually gained knowledge about how evolution happened and why evolution happens. So with this, let's end this lesson and see you all in the next lesson. Thank you. Please visit examfear.com for an easy four-step learning process absolutely free of cost. Watch video lessons, ask questions, refer notes and take an online test. Thank you once again.